I want to be sure to uh, start as we get our panelists up here. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we're going to be going into two parts of this uh, discussion. One will be on the Employment First uh, Oversight Commission, over the Employment First Commission, and then we're going to be talking about supports for uh, college students with uh, disabilities, and we're going to be talking about that. So before we uh, get to our panelists, I want to be sure to welcome uh, the legislators who are so kind to join us here today. We'll start to my far left, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves and let us know where they're from. I am State Representative Anita Kulik. I represent the 45th Legislative District. I am right next door in Bridgeville, Collier, Carnegie, Robinson, Kennedy, and some points north. Okay, not every town senator needs to be yeah. done, uh, but uh, yeah, go ahead. You got more than me. Uh, thank you. I'm State Senator Wayne Fontana. I represent the 42nd District. Uh, we're sitting in part of my district right now, and I have a lot around here, so thank you. Hi, Representative Joe McAndrew. I represent uh, the Penn Hills area. Uh, Representative Abigail Salisbury from District 34. I live in Swissvale, and I represent 12 communities around that area, as well as uh, just the very edge of Pittsburgh. My name is Greg Scott. I'm from Montgomery County, and I represent the communities of Narstown, Conshohocken, and Plymouth Township. Oh, thank you, sir. No, I, pre I appreciate that. That's, uh, Representative Ismail smith Waydell, please call me Izzy. I represent the 49th District, which includes Lancaster City, Lancaster Township, and the borough of Millersville. Thank you. Representative Tarek Khan, oh, that's loud, sorry. <laughs> Call me Tarek. Uh, East, uh, represent Philadelphia County, East Falls, Maniunk, Roxborough, Chestnut Hill. Thanks. Representative Joe Hohenstein, I'm from House District 177, which is about as far away from here as you can get. I'm almost in New Jersey, is the way I said it in the, in the morning. Um, I'm on the Delaware River in uh, Philadelphia. Okay, thank you, uh, all of our guests. I very much appreciate it. And we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to do a very quick summation of our first speakers. So I want to thank them both for being here. First, Dr. Josie ba uh, Badger has founded Badger Consulting, where she provides youth development and disability consulting services. In 2014, she is the National Transition Director for the Span Parent Advocacy Network, the Campaign Manager of the United Way of Southwestern PA's I Want to Work campaign, and the lead field organizer for the Family Care Act, which is a good bill. <laughs> it's my bill. All right. She is the developer of TRAIL, a statewide advocacy and lobbying training program, and she recently founded Peacock, a nonprofit that will further support the needs of the disability community and, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Thank you, Dr. Badger. It was great to see you here, as always. Uh, with her, of course, is Steve Sorovic. He is the president and the CEO of Achieva. He is on the PA Employment First uh, Commission and served as its chair from January 2021 through January of this year. Before joining Achieva in December 2017, Steve has held a number of nonprofit and public sector leadership positions. Thank you both. I appreciate my friends being here. And we'll start with Josie. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for being here, especially to our friends that can't just go home and go to bed. And thank you for being here. Um, so I want you all to take a moment and think about if you can, the first time you were asked what you wanted to be when you grew up. I'm not sure if you would have said a legislator or not, but think about that. And I want to then take you to Facebook, okay? So on Facebook, you can say you're employed, you're not employed, or you're disabled. Think about that. Disability is considered an employment. Although it is a full-time job, it's not a job, and it shouldn't be considered one. We as citizens should be able to be employed to our fullest potential. All individuals who want to work should be able to work. But I promise you that for people with disabilities, it sometimes takes more hours in the day to be able to work than the job itself. Coordinating, looking at crazy codes for Medicaid, trying to make sure you don't make too much or too little, it takes a full-time job. And so this is where the Employment First Oversight Commission 
came from. The, uh, the knowledge that we need a, not only a community, but a state that is there to say, we believe employment first should be what we are striving for for all Pennsylvanians, disabilities or not. We know that there are about 14% of Pennsylvanians who have disabilities. We also know that only about 29% have jobs. Okay, and that's actually quite an improvement. We also know that the unemployment rate of people with disabilities is twice that of individuals without disabilities. And the poverty levels that we live in, even when we do work, is unbelievable. Now take another pause. 9.6% of individuals who have disabilities are entrepreneurs who have started their own business. I'm one of them. I'm an individual who obviously has a disability and realized that the work that needs to be done, there was no place for me. And before the wonderful mod bill, uh, workers with job success, I had to keep myself poor. I have a doctorate and I realized when I left school, I could not afford to be successful. I would lose the very services that allows me to get out of bed every day. So, so hence the work we do. The Employment First Oversight Commission was established through the Employment First Bill of 2018. It was unanimously supported. And I think that proves to us that we as people with disabilities and the Commonwealth have the ability to come together for something good. That's what we need to do to keep moving forward. The Employment First Oversight Commission, which I'm so proud to be the chair of, um, along with my friends Steve and Dan, who are part of it as well, we are charged with monitoring the progress or lack thereof, and then setting goals and recommendations for the state to make sure that we are moving as a state forward to achieving our goals of truly being employment first. Um, every year, we develop a report with some of that data and with recommendations. Um, and those, I hope, you guys take a moment to look over um, last year's you should have received, and we're just starting to work on this coming years. I want you all not to think of this as numbers or data or statistics. I know that that's how we work when we look at policy, but I want you to think of me or Sean, those individuals who have fought so very hard to be in our positions. And you guys also know exactly what we're talking about. You're knocking door to door, talking to people. I know what you do is hard. And we have to do that just to be able to work for Walmart for a minimum wage job. It is a battle every day. And the employment first goal is where we need to be. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to the former chair of the Employment First Oversight Commission to talk about recommendations from the commission. Thanks, Josie. So my, my testimony was uh, submitted in advance and it's a lot longer than I'm gonna do here. Um, I've got a 10 minute summary. I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of reading just because um, the, the recommendations in the report are very specific, um, and I want to make sure I get it right. So, um, thanks. First of all, thanks, Representative Miller, for inviting me. And I just want to, um, as a reminder, a couple definitions. Employment first. It's the, first of all, it's the policy of the Commonwealth. Um, it's outlined in Act 36. So the General Assembly and the Governor um, adopted. Brother, uh, I'm sorry, brother. Um, hey, uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, an insulin kit was found, and it's outside here in the front little lobby area. So I just don't want anybody to not have that kit. So if it's, but thank you, Steve. Sorry again for no your problem. Rub. 
So Act 36 of the 2018 uh, Employment First Act was passed by the General Assembly, signed by the governor, um, um, established Employment First as the policy. And it means competitive integrated employment shall be the first consideration um, and preferred outcome of all public, publicly funded programs like education, employment, training, and long-term supports and services um, serving working age Pennsylvanians with disabilities. So what's competitive integrated employment? It's a fancy term for a job um, where the worker who has a disability works in a typical workplace in the community um, alongside people with and without disabilities, mostly people without disabilities, and is paid at least minimum wage. In the simplest terms, CIE, competitive integrated employment, has to have integration, meaning people, you know, meaning working with uh, people without disabilities, <clears throat> and competitive wages, meaning at least minimum wage or higher. There's, more, there's a more technical definition that the feds have, but I'll skip that for now. Essentially, um, CIE is the opposite of what is commonly referred to <clears throat> as a sheltered workshop where people with disabilities are typically segregated, working with mostly or exclusively with other people with disabilities and are paid less than minimum wage. <clears throat> and that's done legally via a special 14C certificate um, issued by the U.S. Department of Labor. So Pennsylvania Act 36 of 2018, specifically Section 6, um, they created the Employment First Oversight Commission, or EFOC, um, and, it, <clears throat> and it consists mostly of governor-appointed members, and some members are appointed by the legislative leaders. It's statutorily charged with three simple things. <clears throat> Establishing measurable goals and objectives governing the act. <clears throat> tracking the measurable progress of public agencies implementing the act. And then issuing a report <clears throat> that details the progress made on each of the measurable goals and objectives. And then including recommendations to the governor and the general assembly. Our October 2022 report is the EFOC's fourth report since coming into existence. My testimony is focused on the contents of the report. It includes 11, the report includes 11 goals and objectives and 31 specific recommendations. My summary, um, the testimony you have talks about the 11 goals and objectives and talks about um, the recommendations that are focused on the General Assembly. And for this summary, I'm just gonna focus on the recommendations to the General Assembly. So the first recommendation <clears throat> that rates for supported employment services, and supported employment is really what um, those services are that help people with disabilities get jobs in the community um, who need support, like job coaching and job finding and things like that. <clears throat> that the rates <clears throat> supported uh, for supported employment services paid via ODP, we just had the Deputy Secretary uh, of ODP up on the stage. <clears throat> and the Office of Long-Term Living, funded via the Community Health Choices Program, be increased <clears throat> and it be done annually so that there's no longer a financial disincentive for providers to deliver CIE-related services. <clears throat> and just a, some little context, in ODP, <clears throat> rates <clears throat> have only increased once since 2017 and that increase was 0.9% for the three of the four supported employment service codes. With labor cost inflation, fuel inflation, healthcare inflation over the past several years, rates for supported employment services at the very least should keep up with inflation and they should be readjusted annually, but they haven't and they don't. The General Assembly could do something about this right now as the state budget gets finalized over the next few weeks, funding to increase supported employment service rates could be added, <clears throat> and fiscal code language could be added to be sure DHS actually uses the additional funds for supported employment services as intended. The second recommendation that state contractors under Section 520 of the Procurement Code be prohibited from delivering goods and services <clears throat> using subminimum wage labor, and in addition, the General Assembly review whether and to what extent the direct labor percentage requirement of 75% contained in the code may be inconsistent with employment first policy. And that the General Assembly consider reducing that direct labor percentage in a manner that promotes integrated work as defined by the act. Again, just a little background. Um, Section 520 provides a no competitive bid construct 
that enables businesses that affirmatively employ workers with disabilities to secure state contracts for products and services. Some of that labor, albeit a small percentage, is currently paid subminimum wage. And current law requires that 75% of the direct labor used to make those products and services be people with disabilities. And now while the high percentage um, of 75% sounded good decades ago, 75% has the effect of perpetuating a congregate segregated workforce. The EFOC believes that state contracts shouldn't permit subminimum wage and that any direct labor ratio um, that results in or promotes congregate work is inconsistent with em employment first policy. Third recommendation, Act 36 be amended to include and create a position of the executive director um, for an employment first oversight commission. Over four years, it's become clear that the issue can be really complex. Um, and there's a lot of work involved in securing and analyzing and interpreting data, conducting meetings of the EFOC, working with state bureaucracies, and writing an annual report have proven to be very challenging for an all-volunteer uh, citizen commission. Paid staff would really help in this work. Fourth recommendation, that the Employment and Unemployment Subcommittee of the House Labor and Industry Committee and Disability Employment and Empowerment Caucus <clears throat> hold annual hearings to examine um, employment data, employment service utilization, and employment outcomes for working age participants in the Community Health Choices Program. In its testimony, OLTL, which is the Office of Long-Term Living, should be asked to delineate <clears throat> the steps it's taken um, to, you know, during the last year to, <clears throat> to increase employment outcomes for working age CHC participants and the result. According to its own data, Performance outcomes for each managed care organization within the Community Health Choices Program is, are poor. In 2022, there were over 58,000 working age people enrolled in CHC, but only 433 have a competitive integrated job. That's less than 1%. And only 1,074 even had an employment goal indicated in their individualized service plan, 1.87, 1.8%. There's no other conclusion to draw that the MCOs are doing a poor job of complying with your own act, 36. They are doing a poor job of making employment the first consideration and preferred outcome of the long-term supports and services that they provide with public dollars. Fifth recommendation, General Assembly should study and issue a report on the return on investment of the Office of Vocational Rehab's Hiram G. Andrews Center as compared to traditional customer services delivered by OBR. The sixth, rec sixth recommendation <clears throat> that the General Assembly pass legislation and the necessary funding to require each school district to have, according to population size, one or more full-time dedicated and highly qualified or credentialed transition coordinators to support employment <clears throat> and require the PDE Pennsylvania Department of Education to ensure compliance with that requirement. And the seventh re recommendation that I'm gonna share, <clears throat> that the General Assembly amend Act 36 or the State Civil Service Reform Act to remove roadblocks <clears throat> to employment and ensure access and inclusion for people with disabilities to be hired by state government agencies. <clears throat> As you know, state government is either the largest or one of the largest employers in Pennsylvania. It could lead by example could do two things. First, it could pass into law something similar to what the federal government does with its, quote, Schedule A process. Schedule A is simply a uh, special hiring authority that gives federal agencies the ability to hire people, qualified people with uh, disabilities, more, <clears throat> more quickly than the normal bureaucratic process would allow. Second, General Assembly could create a section in the Civil Service Code that permits state agencies to utilize a customized employment job classification. Customized employment is just what it says. It customizes a job description based on the abilities of the worker and the needs of the employer. Customized employment would create job opportunities for otherwise capable applicants with disabilities who, due to their disability, may be able to perform some tasks, but not all tasks listed in the rigid, off-the-shelf job description written by state human resource employees. To their credit, the Governor's Office of Administration is piloting one custom customized employment job um, in the Department of Revenue 
which is commendable, yet um, the EFOC believes this model should be taken to scale across all agencies. Again, there are many more recommendations contained in the EFOC October 22 report, and I encourage members of the panel to take a look at them to get a sense of the breadth and depth of the issues the EFOC is dealing with uh, when it comes to increasing employment outcomes for people with, dis with a disability. But this concludes my testimony for now, and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, when you get to that part of the uh, session. Thank you both, thank you. Um, and I'll pause for uh, questions here. But I will ask, uh, Steve, you brought up transition coordinators. Um, and one of the, um, <clears throat> I have found um, in researching other bills that transition coordinators, um, while I think required under federal law uh, for school districts to have them in some capacity, um, overwhelmingly had a great um, variety, I guess, of support from the schools as well as training to do the job, right? So uh, there were some school districts that were um, prioritizing transition coordination, that they were uh, training, making sure there was a strong interest in that position, uh, versus other schools who were like, you know, assigning like the, uh, the track coach, yeah. you know, to go over and check the box, yeah. right? So um, I, I wonder uh, if you have some thoughts as to what should be done to uh, strengthen that component. Yeah, well, you're exactly right. And uh, um, first of all, the transition, transition really just means, you know, when a student with a disability who has an individual that, individualized education program, um, starting at age 14, um, the special education program in the school district must um, start to transition or do things to help the individual eventually, the student eventually transition. Um, from high school to adult life, hopefully with a job. Um, and I think what the EFOC has realized, um, even though it's required, you're required to have a transition coordinator, most schools, few schools have some, someone dedicated solely to that job. Um, usually it's a, an additional duty on someone's um, job description. Um, and so I think what the EFOC is saying um, is pass, Pass legislation and requiring each school to at least have one, maybe more, depending on the number of students they have, um, and through you know collaboration with the experts, come up with some kind of credential um, or experience uh, credential uh, uh, um, to really put a, a greater emphasis and prioritization on that. I don't know, Josie, if you had anything else. So I am trained as a vocational rehabilitation counselor, and so one of my rotations was working as a transition counselor in Fox Chapel. Um, and in that school district, they did such a fantastic job at supporting the transition counselors. It was a full-time position. But as the daughter of two teachers, I can tell you the teachers are strung out. They are working hard, and they're getting less support. And so, yes, I think teachers should be a part of the transition team, but we should not rely on them for also supporting the transition of each one of those kids with disabilities in the school district. And so we need to be moving forward to support those individuals because guidance counselors don't have the training. Voc rehab sometimes come into the schools, but sometimes not. So we need more embedded folks doing that as their full-time job. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Rep. Salisbury. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask about subminimum wage employment. Um, so I'm on appropriations committee, so when we were doing budget hearings, I, I was asking if when we affect, you know, I'm going to say when, when we effectively double the minimum wage in the state, uh, will subminimum wage workers be able to enjoy a doubling or an increase as well? And so a lot of people told me they thought the minimum wage was the minimum. What, what, how could there be a subminimum? But we have legislation that dates from the 1930s when we were still engaging in eugenics as a normal part of life uh, that says that it's a-okay to pay people with disabilities below the minimum wage because 
I don't know, they aren't as good in some capacity, which I don't agree with. But I have had some people tell me that this is a necessary thing. We have to have sub-minimum wage employment for certain people who have a disability because otherwise they would not be able to engage in a meaningful part of their lives. So in the interest of listening to all opinions, I'm wondering if, if you have opinions on this, if you've heard other people's opinions on this matter, and if you could share that. I think everybody has an opinion on that. Um, I'm the president and CEO of Achieva. Achieva ran, used to run workshops, um, shelter workshops that paid some minimum wage. Before I got there, to their credit, they the board passed a resolution that closed them um, and tr transitioned into competitive integrated work. They did that in 2015 and we closed our last facility during the COVID pandemic. Um, the results of that, if you know, in round numbers, a, a third of the people retired because literally they were going to the workshop every day and they were well over the age of 65 um, and, and this gave them the opportunity to retire. A third um, went to another provider either because they wanted to or their family wanted them to. Um, and then a third got competitive integrated employment. So I always say a third, a third, a third was our experience. Um, now, if they hadn't had another provider to go to, workshop provider to go to, um, I believe um, all two thirds, the third that we supported and then the third that left, um, could, have been, could have been employed in a competitive integrated job. Um, um, I, you know, uh, in my opinion, um, if, someone's if someone's participating in a work activity at a workshop, um, there's a competitive integrated job out there. Um, whether it's a customized employment opportunity, um, it might not be 40 hours a week, um, it might be 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week, and then you've got to do something with the rest of the week in terms of activities and um, doing something in the community. Um, so it may not be 40 hours to 40 hours. Um, but my experience has always been that if, there's, if you're doing something meaningful in a w sheltered workshop, um, you can work, and you can work for competitive wages. That's my opinion. Okay, and before we move to the next, Nick, you got to go sit down. I feel like this is horrible. <laughs> Anybody else see Nick here? I know. Look, Nick, no, please, please. You're making me feel like a horrible boss. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, we're like sheltered workshop, right? <laughs> it just, yeah. Nobody else, I mean, right? Right, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Craig. He's, he works under the table. That's how it is in my office. And he's going to be there for like another 20 minutes until the... Yeah, I don't know what that was. All right. Uh, thank you, Rep. Uh, Salisbury. Let's go to Senator Fontana. Thank you, Representative Miller. Uh, Dr. Bodger, you, you mentioned your training and you worked at Fox Chapel, I think it was. Are, you, is you, are your wages the right wages? You can pay me more. <laughs> um, so I started my own business. Um, and let me tell you why. It wasn't because I was like, Ooh, I want to start my own business. It was because I started my work before the updates for the medical assistance for workers with disabilities. So I had to keep myself poor to be able to have the home and community-based services that I need. I need 24-hour care. Um, fortunately now, my business is doing well, um, but I've kept myself under that 250% federal poverty level until this, our bill goes into effect, um, and it has now. Um, so now I can, you know, take a raise uh, for myself. But, you know, I think something that we are combating is this mis- information across the state from professionals and people with disabilities and families that right. they can't work and earn and get benefits. And we've got to change that narrative. Um, we aren't employed as disabled. That, that's not a thing. Um, I think a lot of us try, but all it is is living within the confines of poverty, and that's not a life at all. Um, so we need to continue to make sure folks know they can work and to allow them to. And part of that is through community health choices, through the other waiver programs. Um, and I'm going to bring up OLTL. They, I have a waiver under Office of Long-Term Living, and 
we receive significantly less services and pay for direct care providers than under ODP. I can only pay $11 an hour for the people that help me every day to do my job, $11 an hour. So if you do the math, individuals tend to take home about $70 for a shift. That makes them showing up negligible. And so we need to make this work matter to them and to us and to make sure they know that they are the professionals that they really are. Well, the point is you should get paid what you're worth and what your training is on top of the services that you need. Yeah. That's where I was I going know. with this. It's true, sir. Um, yeah. And that's all of us, not just me, all yeah, of absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And that type of critical work is worth much more than eleven dollars an hour okay i think i think that was that was it for this panel i want to thank you both uh, as we bring up the next two i also want to recognize that representative kincaid thank you uh has joined us she got applause that was oh no okay all right well like you know all right very pro emily crowd okay so we're going to wait for one moment and uh bring up our next speakers uh thank you what do you need? No, no, now you're on the floor. Not for me. Oh. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so <laughs> there you go. All right, so we're going to introduce um, our uh, two next speakers. Uh, uh, one is uh, Katya Albanese, who comes to us from the State Exchange on Employment and Disability, better known as SEED. Uh, she will introduce a uh, short video uh, from one of the nation's leading disability attorneys, Eve Hill. And then uh, Marcy Katana is with us. She's worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry uh, Office of Vocational Re uh, Rehabilitation, OVR, for 23 years. Wow. Sorry. Wow. Uh, in February 2023, Marcy was appointed to the position of Bureau Director of OVR's Bureau of Vocational Rehab Services, uh, better known as BVRS where she's responsible for overseeing the Bureau's program operations for 15 district offices statewide. Who are we going to first? I believe I'm going first. And oh. I am going to give a few remarks before I introduce Eve. All right, just watch the mic if you can. What do you mean watch it? There we go. All right, thank Let's you. Speak into it. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the State Exchange on Employment and Disability, affectionately referred to as SEED, thank you again for this opportunity to be here today and to be part of this unique bipartisan legislative session focused on disability inclusive policy. Um, we really applaud your commitment to uh, moving these policies forward and for striving to make Pennsylvania a leader in creating opportunities for people with disabilities to be recruited, hired, promoted, um, and retained in the Commonwealth. Uh, my name is Katya Albanese. I'm the project director for SEED. Um, and we're ex especially excited to be here today to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Disability and Mental Health Policy Summit to be back here in Western PA in person. Um, we commend Rep Miller and his awesome team for their incredible efforts to continue hosting this important event and for serving as a model, um, not only to other districts, but to other states to focus on the disability community around these important issues. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues on the panel today from the Employment First Oversight Commission and the impressive work they've done, which has re resulted in these set of recommendations we heard a little bit about, um, to help your legislature really prioritize the steps to build the infrastructure to support disability inclusive workforce development in Pennsylvania. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with SEED, um, SEED works with policymakers and state and local governments to support the development, adoption, and implementation of inclusive policies and best practices leading to increased employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, as a policy assistance initiative, SEED is a unique collaboration and we're funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. It's a small non-regulatory office within the U.S. Department of Labor that works to increase workplace su success for people with disabilities. And we're here to help, to provide an avenue for state and local policymakers to request information that supports your policy goals around disability employment. It's just really important to note, though, that our initiative is not the federal government telling states what to do, but the leveraging of federal resources to support customized policy solutions for your constituencies that meet your policy prior priorities but have the common goal of removing barriers and improving employment opportunities for people with disabilities. 
So obviously, disability employment is a major focus of ours at SEED and the U.S. Department of Labor, but why? Um, because people with disabilities, which we've heard um, from our other speakers, face stark employment inequities compared to people without, which is unfortunate given the untapped talent pool they represent. And just to be clear, when we talk about people with disabilities and when you're thinking about who these policies will impact, we're referring to individuals who are born with or acquire a disability, so become ill or injured in the workplace. Um, people who have physical, developmental, intellectual, mental health conditions, which we heard a lot about this morning, visible or invisible, like learning disabilities, um, neurodivergent disabilities, like autism, ADHD. People with disabilities also include, of course, our nation's disabled veterans, individuals who are recovering from substance use disorder, and one in four Americans who have acquired a disability due to COVID-19. So we know that people with disabilities want to work and have the unique skills and talents that American employers are looking for, and research shows that they bring bottom line benefits to our nation's businesses, offering employers a competitive edge while helping to diversify and strengthen their workplaces. And did you know that individuals with disabilities have lower turnover rates, lower medical expenses, and lower time off spent compared to their non-disabled employees? <laughs> um, did you know that rather than participating in the great resignation, people with disabilities remained engaged in the labor market throughout the pandemic? Their labor force participation rate did not drop appreciably early on in the pandemic, as was expected, and has hovered just above its historic high, which dates back to just before the Great Recession. So, while the overall post-lockdown economic recovery of people with disabilities remains relatively strong, and in fact stronger than the economic recovery of people without disabilities, the labor force participation rate of working age people with disabilities as of April 2023 is only around 38.3%. Compare that with working age people without disabilities, whose labor force participation rate is around 77.2%. That's a 40% differential, basically which means there's an untapped pool of individuals who can help fill the workforce gaps. And according to the most recent disability compendium, Pennsylvania's labor participation rate is slightly lower than a national average, and the Commonwealth ranks 33rd in the nation for the employment of people with disabilities. And like most states, Pennsylvania is dealing with so many compounding labor participation issues like the Great Resignation, the Silver Tsunami, the COVID recovery, worker shortages, you name it, we have it, right? Especially in state government. So in short, people with disabilities represent a solution to workforce challenges and can fill those gaps to this immediate need in state government. And in fact, like we heard from our Previous speaker states as employers, in many cases, one of the largest employers in the state can lead as example for other employers by ensuring inclusive hiring and retention practices in state government. For the legislators in the room, you have the ability to put policies in place to build the infrastructure needed for Pennsylvania to become a model employer of people with disabilities, several of which are included in those recommendations by the Employment First Oversight Committee, Commission. And with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Eve Hill, who unfortunately was not able to join us in person. Eve is uh, one of the nation's leading disability rights attorneys. She serves as our SEED's Legislative and Policy Council, uh, where she researches and drafts policy options for state policymakers interested in advancing employment of opportunities for people with disabilities. And among her numerous accomplishments, yeah, just give me one more second. <laughs> um, Eve served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. She's implemented Olmstead Community Integration Requirements in Employment and Education and Enforced Disability Rights and Education Testing and Healthcare. And Eve is going to provide additional details regarding state as a model employer policies with a special focus or a specific focus on fast track and other similar hiring systems, which are some of the most effective ways of increasing representation of people with disabilities within a state workforce. And she's also going to share examples of what other states have done to enact policies around this policy option. And Eve's remarks with links to the examples she will mention along with the more comprehensive policy brief on state as a model employer, um, including and beyond fast track hiring. This is just one of dozens of um, options you could um, implement in your state was submitted as background information for this panel and should be available to you electronically. So with that, thank you. Okay, it is Eve Hill. Thank you for having me today. 
I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the State Exchange on Employment and Disability, or SEED. SEED is an initiative funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy to assist states in developing effective and inclusive workforce policies that promote disability employment. Recognizing that every state is unique, SEED offers policy options and resources that states can tailor to meet their needs and goals. States can send a clear message that employment of people with disabilities is a high priority first by implementing a comprehensive set of policies and practices known collectively as state as a model employer policies. These policies help to increase representation of people with disabilities within public sector workforces. When acting as model employers, the states also have an opportunity to serve as examples for private employers demonstrating the economic and organizational benefits of hiring people with disabilities. To this end, SEED recommends a number of principles to help states become model employers of people with disabilities. Among those principles are the adoption of formal policies through legislation or executive order, creating infrastructure through cabinet positions, working groups, or advisory boards, establishing government-wide strategic plans, implementing diversity and inclusion initiatives, including affirmative and positive action, implementing fast track and other hiring systems, carrying out advancement and retention policies and procedures such as reasonable accommodation systems, centralized reasonable accommodation funds, telework policies, and stay at work and return to work policies, focusing on accessibility of websites and other information and communication technologies, adopting policies for provision of personal assistance services, and offering disability awareness training for state staff. I note that Pennsylvania has already taken action to implement disability-related diversity and inclusion initiatives, including establishing a governor's cabinet for people with disabilities and advisory committee for people with disabilities, setting a goal of having 7% of its workforce be people with disabilities, and that goal has been making steady progress, and implementing an executive order emphasizing that experience can replace a college degree as a qualification for state employment. In addition, recommendations have been made by the Employment First Oversight Commission to establish employment first infrastructure within the government, to reframe procurement preferences for government suppliers, to incentivize competitive integrated work for people with disabilities rather than segregated work, to permit creation of customized employment job classifications within agencies, and to create a fast track hiring system for people with disabilities. I want to focus today on fast track and other similar hiring systems, which are some of the most effective ways of increasing the representation of people with disabilities within a state workforce. Special appointment authorities, trial work periods, and paid internships that are intended to result in permanent employment are very effective fast track hiring mechanisms for increasing employment of people with disabilities. Perhaps the most famous of these is the federal Schedule A program under which federal agencies may hire a person with a significant disability without going through the usual competitive process. When hired through Schedule A, the person remains a Schedule A employee for two years and upon successful completion of that period, converts to a permanent employee. Pennsylvania's proposal, HB 348, would be similar to Schedule A in that it would allow eligible individuals with disabilities to be appointed non-competitively to a temporary or permanent position. Appointment may be to a temporary position if it is necessary to observe the individual in order to tell if he or she is able or ready to perform the job. Appointment may be to a permanent position if it is likely the person will succeed in the job based on his or her education and experience. And a temporary appointment may be converted to a permanent position once it's determined that the person can do the job. At that point, the general probationary period begins. For a permanent employment appointment, the probationary period begins immediately upon appointment and the person will be converted to classified service if performance during the probationary period is satisfactory. A number of states have implemented similar programs. The Alaska Provisional Hire Program, which is authorized by statute, allows hiring managers to offer provisional appointment without competitive assessment to applicants with severe disabilities for up to four months with the possibility of transitioning the provisional employee to permanent employment. Delaware established a selective placement program. That program provides hiring managers with direct access to place qualified candidates with disabilities 
into vacant positions by bypassing some of the complicated and time-consuming processes. New Jersey provides fast-track hiring and employment advancement opportunities by the state for persons with significant disabilities. Utah established the Alternative State Application Process, or ASAP, for individuals with disabilities, under which qualified candidates with disabilities may be appointed to fill vacant positions for a six-month month trial examination period. And Virginia enacted HB 2140 in 2021, which directs the Department of Human Resources Management to create an alternative application process for the employment of persons with a disability. The process must be non-competitive in nature and provide an option for agencies to convert positions filled through the non-competitive process. States have also implemented trial work and paid internship programs for people with disabilities that lead to permanent employment, including in Florida, which offers programs that incorporate internships, mentoring, on-the-job training, unpaid work experience, situational assessments, and other innovative strategies that are specifically geared toward individuals with disabilities. In Illinois, applicants with severe disabilities may be eligible for supported employment during a trial work period with the possibility of permanent employment thereafter. Also, Illinois offers a trainee program for persons with a disability and authorizes state agencies to offer at least one position per year to be filled by a person with a disability through the trainee program. Maine offers a trial work period of up to one year for candidates certified by vocational rehabilitation. Mandatory interviews can also help those otherwise qualified applicants with disabilities to get a foot in the door in the state government. Maryland's Fast Track program provides individuals with disabilities the opportunity to engage in training programs or an internship under Maryland's Quest program. Also, Maryland enacted HB 1466 in 2017, which authorizes the selection of disabled veterans for positions in the state personnel management system using a specified selection process. And Nevada has a so-called 700-hour program that provides for temporary limited appointment of persons with disabilities by state agencies. A number of states have also implemented preferences to increase hiring of people with disabilities. In Arizona, individuals with disabilities are given a five-point preference on examinations. Colorado has a hiring preference pilot program with the state's Department of Labor and Education and Employment. Montana requires that individuals with disabilities be hired over individuals without disabilities when the two are substantially equal in qualifications. And Virginia requires any locality to take into consideration or give preference to an individual's status as the person with a disability in its hiring policies, provided that the person meets all the knowledge, skills, and eligibility requirements for the position. Still other states offer mandatory interviews to applicants with disabilities. Maryland requires appointment authorities to interview disabled veterans under specific circumstances. And the state of Vermont operates a mandatory interview process for state employment that's available to any qualified individual with a disability. When applicants with mandatory interview status meet the minimum qualifications for a posting, the hiring authority is required to offer an interview. Other states waive or modify civil service exams for applicants with disabilities. Illinois, for example, offers the Successful Disability Opportunity Program, which establishes an alternative examination process for individuals with disabilities. It provides the application, applicant with an SD score that replaces the standard score on the civil service exams, places the individual on an SD program list, and qualifies the individual for agency hiring consideration. Oklahoma's optional program for hiring applicants with disabilities provides for an alternative certification process for civil service that waives all tests related to, to civil service eligibility. And Utah established the Alternative State Application Program for individuals with disabilities, allowing for, allowing for on-the-job examinations in lieu of civil service testing. Thank you again for inviting me to testify at this important hearing today. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, and let's go over to Marcy for her comments and then we'll do questions. Marcy. Okay, thank you. I feel like I'm wrapping this up, right? 
Um, well, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of OVR's Executive Director Ryan and Ryan Hyde and OVR's entire leadership team, I want to thank you, Representative Miller, and to all the legislators in attendance today for the opportunity to speak and share a little bit about OVR with you. My name is Marcy Katona, and I'm the director for the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And as Representative Miller shared, I've uh, been a, uh, a Commonwealth employee for 23 years and counting, uh, with the, all with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. As you may know, the PA OVR, uh, PA OVR is an agency within PA Department of Labor and Industry. OVR's mission is to assist Pennsylvanians with disabilities to secure and maintain employment and independence. In your packet today, you'll have our OVR highlight sheet um, outlining our 2021 program year. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that and, and share that um, where you're able in, in your communities. OVR's mission aligns well with the employment first uh, oversight Commission priorities and recommendations and I'd like to take some time today to talk with you about that our priorities our services and our accomplishments that have and will keep Pennsylvania succeeding in the employment first arena a little bit about OVR structure um, uh, we have our Bureau of Central Operations our Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services that runs five programs our indive independent living older older blind program, our specialized services, our uh, uh, business enterprise program, uh, our vocational rehabilitation program, uh, all within the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. The Bureau of Vocational Rehab Services uh, uh, serves uh, the, I think uh, Katya gave a, a great summary of the range of disability that uh, we serve, um, not only with youth, but all uh, individuals uh, who may have acquired or uh, have uh, experienced disability at any stage during uh, their life. This past year, OVR's priorities have been focused on staffing, outreach, and referral, and financial investment. OVR's relationship with the Office of Developmental Programs and the Bureau of Special Education is critical to our success, in addition to all of our collaborations with other state and Commonwealth agencies. Uh, we have memorandums of understanding that foster collaboration and resource sharing to maximize the opportunities uh, for our shared customers. And I just want to thank um, uh, Dr. Carol Clancy and Acting Secretary Dr. Arkush and Kristen Ahrens for these critical partnerships. Uh, my uh, colleagues here on the panel, and, and um, it's uh, a privilege to be able to be here with you to, to, to share OVR's uh, linkage and, and what we're doing um, within Commonwealth employment, within the Commonwealth to uh, be a model employer. Um, some of which are direct uh, programs that we're working on. A couple of the things that I think um, we, we heard um, in earlier remarks uh, that, that line up with uh, Pennsylvania being a model employer is uh, Pennsylvania has hired a disability recruiter. Um, the state it, it has taken serious look at our civil service testing requirements to reduce uh, minimum education and training to bring uh, to eliminate barriers where we can. Um, we have hired a statewide assistive technology coordinator. Um, specifically, uh, OVR uh, is excited to be um, gearing up for our uh, labor and industry summer internship program. We have a goal of uh, employing 30 students with disabilities within our, within our Commonwealth um, agencies. We also have a partnership with uh, unemployment comp compensation in which we're working in collaboration to uh, assist uh, in uh, providing individuals with disabilities to um, be hired to work help desk support within uh, UC. We are um, doing, you, you heard earlier about the customized employment with OA, um, the Office of Administration. We're also working with PennDOT to do a customized employment uh, placement within the Commonwealth. And um, we're in continued discussions within uh, the Commonwealth and Office of Administration to, to expand that concept to additional agencies. 
We're also working with the Department of Conservation and National Resources to do a uh, work crew specifically uh, for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we're, we are uh, linked with our community partners for the Centers of Independent Living to do internships within our independent living partnerships and we're also um, able to uh, we're doing internships with a unique source within the Commonwealth um, our I mentioned BEP that's a program under the our Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services that's primary mission is to serve individuals with blindness or uh, visual impairment um, we are excited to be launching and continuing to transform the business enterprise program uh, into our micro markets within our L&I building and continuing to grow that out. Uh, OVR's program runs by drawing down federal dollars via state match. We currently are operating on an open order of selection, which means we have no wait list to eligible customers. Since 2020, we've been increasing our customer base and referrals. Um, we're, we're, we've exceeded 21,000 this year, and that's increased by 35% since this time last year. Uh, we talked about you know coming into post-pandemic um, uh, times, and the goal has really been to um, recover and, and, and grow where we had been prior to 2020. This past year, we began implementing rapid engagement, which is a national strategy focused on processing time for customers from application eligibility to plan development. And we saw a decrease in our processing time to serve customers through the initial application uh, through to plan um, with, uh, you know, a, a, with decreased time over uh, 53, 38% and 44% um, respectively. So the point of that is to engage customers quickly and effectively um, from the beginning because this, uh, our research data nationally shows that, you know, as a, as a customer, any of us want to uh, come to receive a service, be considered for a service, and get that uh, response and service as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And that continues to increase your engagement in the process. OVR has been very busy establishing and implementing programs to serve our customers. Um, we're doing that in um, three areas under the Disability Innovation Fund. Um, uh, the one that uh, we are currently very active in working on is the subminimum wage to competitive integrated employment, or SWCHI, um, which is uh, uh, the focus is to target students and youth with disabilities um, who are in subminimum wage um, or persons with disabilities already engaged in subminimum wage. Um, I think I, just to correct my comment, the, the two focuses target students and youth with disabilities considering going into subminimum wage and then individuals that are already engaged um, to, uh, re, to set goals and develop opportunity for uh, competitive integrated employment. Um, it's a five-year grant, just under $14 million. We're in year one, which is set up in um, planning. Um, our focus there is to uh, decrease, continue to work with PA, um, uh, ODP to decrease uh, uh, individuals who are in subminimum wage settings. Okay, Marcy. I apologize too, because I'm watching the clock mm -hmm. a little bit here. Do you mind if I move you for a moment forward on something? Sure. Yep. In relation to the employment first, recommendations, mm -hmm. one of the challenges that I think um, um, uh, that I come across often was is the entry into employment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so how people get their first job uh, and your agency's work specifically yeah. on that. The commission's been around for, I think it said four years of their reports. Um, has there been any um, substantive changes of how OVR operates uh, in relation to the employment first recommendations or commission's findings. Has that impacted OVR at all? Absolutely, I think, I mean, our, our mission has been competitive integrated employment for, um, you know, the, the history of our program. Um, you know, as far as first job entry, um, uh, we're, 
uh, there, there's a couple other grants we're looking to do, um, which is um, in collaboration with the Bureau of Special Education for our pre-employment transition program. I think that's uh, where where you might be going with that. Um, uh, the you know the things that. Um, you know the the employment first commission has allowed us to do is to you know focus our efforts to align you know w with that um, it's certainly um, uh, key to the heart of our mission um, and it allows us to strategically you know uh, implement that out um, I did want to talk a little bit about our rapid rapid hire project um, that's to focus on high school and college students who will be graduating or have recently graduated along with other eligible OVR customers not seeking post-secondary training. This aligns directly with the Employment First um, recommendations. Um, things that I, I think is key to, to the recommendations too are our pre-employment transition programs. Um, specifically, OVR this summer is projected to invest 15 to 17 million um, dollars in our pre-employment transition services, one of which is a, to expand our, uh, our My Work program, um, which is our work uh, opportunity for students with disabilities. It's a paid work-based work learning experience for students with disabilities at municipality and nonprofits over the summer. Last year, we employed uh, 325 students across the Commonwealth um, with, within municipalities and community agencies, and this year we're projected a 60% increase, adding 12 new counties. The goal by 2024 is to have a program in the summer for, for, every, um, uh, for every county. I just have a, a couple more things I want to add. And I appreciate it. I want to be sure to get to the members before they yeah. go, but I need, and I apologize with it, I need to move a little bit. So. If you can get to that strong last point with the two, I want to get to sure. members before they have to leave. Sure. Um, the importance of our summer programs, um, you know, specifically, um, I also want to recognize our summer academies um, with the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Bl Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. Um, these are uh, college integrated um, summer academies. Um, we also have our Hiram G. Andrews Center, um, Commonwealth Technical Institute that allows um, for uh, you know, inclusive, comprehensive program um, that uh, will, you know, again, give opportunities for not only students um, but adults to enter competitive integrated employment. Um, so just in closing, I just want to say, you know, I mentioned a few very specific things. Um, you know, there are local programs across our 15, 21 district offices that, that may not have been named, but all of those in collaboration with um, our, our, our mission is what is bringing a, a success within the realm of competitive integrated employment for the Commonwealth. Thank you. Representative Kahn. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I just have a question about <clears throat> possibly linking some of the some of the things we're hearing as le as legislators is that there's a huge labor shortage for certain positions, and then we have folks with disability who are interested, willing, and able to work, and are unable to get these are are, are having problems getting employment. And I know that there are specific programs around employment first and helping people get them trained. I wonder, is there something else that, that, that can be offered or some, some other strategy to sort of help to address some of the workforce shortages and make the, and make the efforts around employment first also tie into that specifically? And like the narrative, like here we have a big pool of individuals who are able to work and that want to work that can help with this, with this problem and maybe solve two problems with Yes, thank you. Just to give you some ideas, and we can follow up in the interest of time, but apprenticeship is an option. And so there's been obviously a, a trend in apprenticeship from given the federal dollars that have been going to apprenticeship programs in the states. And um, inclusive apprenticeship is something that we've been trying to promote, especially through policy development, to ensure that people with disabilities are being included, being targeted and included in those apprenticeship opportunities, which gives them an opportunity to work in these fields that are dealing with worker shortages. Um, another trend is in apprenticeship programs for civic jobs, so state government 
agencies are implementing apprenticeship programs and some are looking at inclusivity in those programs. So we can share those examples with you. And just to add to that, OVR is actively working within our business services department. What, it, what I didn't get into was in every component to the program, we, we are engaged with our employer community partners and um, also considering and looking to develop those apprenticeships. Thanks. It just seems like in our discussions among these different areas that we need workers, I, I, feel, like, I feel like disability, folks with disabilities, never come up about potential solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think we're all here, is to ensure that you are making, that you're bringing light to that and ensuring that people with disabilities are specifically included. And, and speaking of which, obviously, uh, Eve went over uh, a variety of states' yeah. successes, yeah. Uh, obviously. Um, it seems like Pennsylvania more so stands out for a story that's not told uh, because there is no progress in those arenas. Uh, so I think that testimony really kind of pushes back to us the need to do something that advances anything right. along these lines. Yeah. Yes. You, you can do lots of things, and that's what that policy brief is about. There's um, all sorts of options that are no fun to low fun to, you know, um, that would cost you know, some funding, but around state as a model employer, um, to self-employment and um, state procurement. There are lots of options that Pennsylvania could take advantage of that may be um, already in existence, and, 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 you know, that you may already have policies that just need to be expanded or to create new ones. But we can assist you with that. That's something that SEED can do, a, what we call a crosswalk, to look at all your policies and provide you with the gaps. But you have the Employment First Commission, and they've right. done that already. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to point to the highlight sheet, and you're absolutely right, 53,000 individuals engaged with OVR in 2021. Now, those are di at different points across somebody's um, need for services, right? But you're building that natural untapped pipeline, and that's the exact uh, goal of our agency to do. Uh, and finally, Marcy, uh, OVR, as far as uh, vacancies, are you guys running high internally? Yeah, staffing's been a priority since, um, you know, it, for even prior to 2020. Um, uh, yes, we we are we are on the the up with that. Um, I think our 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 toughest area uh, of of continued vacancy is in our south. A southeast corner and look at my friends over here um, so it is something that it, as far as some of the other uh, discussions today about getting workforce needs met um, has been a, a challenge that we're we're continuing to to problem solve and, and work towards uh, is it getting to a point where your mission is becoming challenging from a staffing perspective or in general yeah uh, is is the uh, lower staffing numbers starting to impact your ability to, to complete your mission? Yeah, it's certainly, be, I mean, it's a priority and continues to be a priority. So it's definitely something that um, we need to continue to improve on. We recently changed our, um, it within for OVR positions within our counseling profession for, you know, a, a good chunk of our staff is uh, our vocational rehab rehabilitation counselors as, as Josie and I both are, um, you know, by education, you know, that's my background. Um, we recently changed the requirements there to expand that, so um, it has really seen an uptick in our ability to onboard new staff in the, in the recent years. Um, and I'm, I'm, I could share more information if anyone's interested in that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you both for your time and for your testimony today. Our last topic uh, for, the, for the day is in relation to college uh, students with disabilities and the supports uh, that are available uh, in Pennsylvania colleges. This is our last um, uh, discussion, so we'll ask our, our two first presenters to come on up. Uh, and I will introduce them. You know, Daphna, did I, did I say Gans last time or Gans? What did I do? Gans, but I pronounced it wrong last time, right? 
I thought I did. All right, so first is Dr. Daphna Gans. Uh, Daphna is a health policy expert who works, addresses uh, non-medical interventions for treating children with autism, she, uh, also access to quality care for persons with developmental disabilities, equitable access to health care among under, underserved minority individuals. Excuse me. I was rushing and those with limited English proficiency and much, much more. Daphna currently serves as the president of the Upper St. Clair School Board, and she is the mom of a college-age daughter. Thank you, Daphna, for uh, being here as well with Kristen Wydas, uh, is a partner at Reuter Law and is licensed to practice in the United States District Court uh, in, both, in all the Western, Middle, and Eastern Districts of PA, as well as United States Court of Appeals in the Third Circuit. She serves as Zone 6 Delegate in the Pennsylvania Bar Association House of Delegates, and she was selected as a Pennsylvania Rising Star by Super Lawyers in 21 and 22. Thank you both for being here to talk about college students with disabilities and what we are getting or not getting and where our challenges could be and how we can help uh, our young students find support or uh, find success in colleges today. So we'll start with Daphna. Thank you. Sorry. Um, good afternoon, representatives and senators. I'm honored to be here today as a healthcare policy expert to talk about an issue of equity, of social justice that could and should be addressed by public policy. I'm also here as an advocate, as a proud parent of a college student who is brilliant and empathetic, creative and funny, an honor student, and also neurodivergent. And I choose to begin with her words, with her permission. I was told that college is going to be the greatest experience ever. It's so different from other levels of school, everyone told me. The best years of your life. You get to study what you want to study. You get treated like an adult with respect. You'll socialize, meet people you'll be friends with for the rest of your life. You won't have to worry about other students not pulling their weight when you work on group projects. These are the best years of your life, they all said. I've seen the effect college had on my brother. He m made so many friends. He found his future girlfriend there. The work was hard, but he found it interesting. He encouraged me to go and, like him, let loose and have fun. But I knew college would be what college would be. It would be school, but worse. School, but harder. School, but with even higher expectations put on you. School, but you had to start over with no friends. School, but you didn't even get to go home at the end of the day. School, but even more nerve-wracking. And everyone told me how wrong I was, how great it would be once I got there. Well, I got there, and it turned out I was right about everything. Not everything about it is awful, but a lot of it really is. My parents sounded disappointed when I described college to them because they truly believed what they told me and wanted me to have a great experience, but I didn't. I do not intend to disparage anyone with my words. My intent is not to insult anyone. I genuinely do not believe that many of these people explicitly meant to hurt me or are bad people. But for the sake of others who may be treated in a similar way, I feel obligated to share my experience. When we looked at colleges, we always made sure to ask about accommodations. The one we picked seemed good. We were told the professors were capable of handling students with autism and that I would receive all the accommodations that are required. I won't lie and say I've received no help at all. The staff involved in housing and dining have been very kind and helpful. Academically speaking, though I've yet to really need it, I have the option of extra testing time and private testing. The cracks in the system began to show when I found out that most classes require instructor permission to register. So you're at the mercy of the professors to accept you to their classes. Recently, I requested to join a mandatory class for my major. The specific class involves student workshops, meaning I would be receiving criticism from my classmates. I was warned of this when meeting with the instructor. I can take criticism personally sometimes, and I visibly tense up when I receive it. This is not indicative of me not listening to it. I always try to take criticism to heart. I explained to my professor that my intense facial expressions are often caused by anger towards myself for not catching my own mistakes. 
the instructor also brought up participation, or rather my over-participation. During a class of taking with them previously, I was told I was participating too much and dominating conversations and was instructed to limit the number of times I raised my hand. This was seemingly what the instructor remembered most about me. They expressed concern that my over-participation would annoy other students, how they may roll their eyes again whenever I begin to speak. Needless to say, I found this incredibly insulting. The instructor rejected me from the class and redirected me to a one-on-one -on -one class in the form of independent study. Instead of allowing me to decide for myself whether I could handle this course, I was told that no, I couldn't handle it and was shoved into a box away from the other students so I don't bother them anymore. When it really began to fall apart was in the social aspects. I admit I'm, inca I'm incredibly stubborn when it comes to asking for help. This is due to years of ineffective response to support requests. I was reluctant to go to the accommodations office for help, but in my sophomore year, I finally did. I explained that I'd been having trouble making friend. The advice I received was the same advice I've received my entire life. Go to, par go to parties, join clubs. I've been to parties. I find them nightmarish and completely unenjoyable. As for clubs, only one or two interest me. There's one club I regularly attend and enjoy, though I find it difficult to engage with the other club members outside of the meetings. I express to the support staff my issues about, with regards to talking to others, that I often feel I'm intruding and I don't know when I can join in on a conversation. The same advice they give everyone was thrown at me. Try more clubs, try to talk to more people. And when it didn't fit, they just told me to make it fit. So in fact, I tried to advocate for myself, despite finding it hard to do. I've tried to, to reach out to professors for help. I told the professor who put me in independent study that I'm working to improve my ability to take criticism. I told the student support service staff that I'd heard this advice before. If people are not receptive to what I have to say, it's hardly an issue of self-advocacy. It's an issue of listening. So let me stop here for a minute before I read the rest of her, her, her comments and switch hats to my uh, public health professor hat. And I'll still do all of this in less than 10 minutes. Um, the number of individuals with autism has been rising steadily, as we all know, which means that more diagnosed young adults are graduate high, graduating high school and he headed off to college. Although a similar percentage of students with autism and neurotypical individuals plan to pursue post-secondary education, only about a third of them actually attend a four-year college. Of them, only about 41% actually graduate college compared to 59% of their neurotypical peers. A college degree is critical to getting higher paying jobs and access to quality health care. And if we can't figure out why there's a discrepancy between neurotypical and neurodivergent dropout rates and fix it, we may be ignoring a systemic disadvantage. College students on the autism spectrum may face academic challenges, including issues of time management and organization. But perhaps more importantly, these students experience low quality social relationships, a high likelihood of being bullied, and difficulty managing emotions such as anxiety, frustration, and stress. Social activity is a large part of living on campus, and difficulties in social interaction are the core deficit of autism. So it's no surprise that research finds that most autistic students report not receiving adequate support in post-secondary education. The healthcare and education system provides an extensive multifaceted support for children with autism. However, autism goes beyond childhood. It's a lifelong condition. The transition to college is rough on anyone, let alone someone with autism struggling with the social aspects of life. Not taking the same multifaceted approach for college accommodations denies this group of students their, men their um, full collegiate experience, adversely impacting their mental health and college graduation chance. This may marginalize an entire group of students, restricting them and their future prospects. 
So addressing this complex issue requires intervention not just at the individual level, but at the institutional level. It requires systemic change. And as an expert and a parent, I'm here today to ask you to take action. And I will close with my daughter's words. And fair warning, these are her words, so they're a bit raw. Even though I'm likely transferring and maybe this new school will be better, I'm never getting the first two years of my college career back. I never will. It sucks. It sucks to be treated like this. It sucks not to be able to rely on professors and college staff to help me. It sucks not to have friends to hang out with. It sucks to be, to be told you participate too much. It sucks to be told nobody can help you. It sucks to sit at a table in a lunchroom and be forced to move by students, which happens all the time, by the way. It sucks to not be able to enjoy the free time I get with my schedule because I'm too worried about school to relax. And it sucks to feel lesser than everyone else. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to make things better. Maybe this is all my own fault. But if there is some way to make it so other people don't go through the same thing, I hope it happens. Because this sucks. And I don't want other people to have it suck for them too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Kristen. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to all of you today. Um, as uh, Representative Miller mentioned, I'm a partner at Reuter Law. Uh, our firm works exclusively with the families and students with disabilities across Pennsylvania. Um, and in my role in the firm, I manage all of the cases that come in that involve students, in particular, in higher education. So, as a legal practitioner, I'm frequently asked to represent individuals who are either experiencing challenges already in the college setting or who are proactively trying to come and seek guidance as to how they will actually access the services and supports that are available. Um, I was asked to speak to the current guidelines that apply to Pennsylvania's colleges and, and universities um, and also to potentially highlight some of the areas that can possibly be improved. And I found um, that probably the easiest way to do that is to sort of um, compare and contrast the obligations that currently exist and that parents are pretty comfortable with with uh, K through 12 institutions and then the differences that they face when they transition into the college situation. Um, so first, there are two statutes broadly, federal statutes that apply to colleges and universities across the country, but in particular in Pennsylvania, and that is the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And just broadly, they um, prohibit discrimination um, for qualified individuals with disabilities um, and prevent exclusion from participation in programs. I think I might be too close to this, I'm sorry. Um, if an individual establishes that they're they're qualified to participate. Um, and that's obviously one of the key differences between the K through 12 system and the, the college system. Um, students have to be able to first walk in the door and access the opportunity, whereas you know K through 12, they're permitted to come regardless of who they are and, and what needs they have. Um, colleges and universities are not allowed to request a, a information about a student's disability status pre-application, um, but they are allowed to ask for information post a student being admitted in the event that the student might need accommodations in order to access the program that they're um, applying to participate in. Um, so one of the key differences, though, that is important and that I find that my clients are often surprised by um, is that colleges and universities don't have the obligation to identify the students that have these needs or proactively provide supports and services in the same way that public schools do K through 12. Um, public schools K through 12 have to look out for students that are struggling and reach out and offer supports. That's not the case at the college level. Um, students need to reach out to the university, the designated person. Um, traditionally, what I see in Pennsylvania is that there will be um, a disability services office that's set up at the college that is sort of the gatekeeper for all disability service questions, accommodation requests. Um, students or their parents need to approach that person, provide appropriate documentation of the disability status. Um, the school is allowed to ask additional questions regarding the medical records or the documentation that's provided um, for sufficiency purposes. They can ask for updates each year, which again is different from the uh, K through 12 system. Once a student establishes a medical condition or a disability, they don't have to continue to prove it year after year. Um, 
And once the documentation is provided, the student then has to sit down without their parent with the designated person in the disability services office or the equivalent at that school or university and engage in a conversation where they request accommodations or make suggestions um, that they think would be reasonable given the circumstances. Um, and that person at the college or university level um, just needs to be willing to collaborate. So, while some um, you know, disability service offices are better than others, you know, technically under the law, a, a, a student that doesn't necessarily have great self-advocacy skills or has never been asked to do this on their own before um, is walking into a situation where the person on the other side of the table doesn't have to make any broad offerings of services and supports or lay out for them what's available. Um, and not having been in the college setting before, that student often understandably struggles to come up with what they might need before ever walking into a, a college class. Um, so I think that that's one area that I see is often um, a challenge and is, is something that um, we could potentially all work together between the high school level and then you know, the transition services available in the state of Pennsylvania to sort of address that for students because right now there is definitely a gap there. Um, even with the best of intentions, students don't necessarily know how to ask, what to ask, um, or what's available at the college level when they walk into those meetings. Now once they have developed that plan with the administrator at the college level, um, they then are responsible, the student, to take that plan to the individual professors and provide it to the professor and ask for the accommodations to be implemented. Again, another potentially scary situation for that student, although again, we're, we're talking about students that are now moving into the college setting, so it's understandable that they're being asked to talk to professors, but they are the ones responsible for making that transition. Um, I have seen some schools in Pennsylvania, though, already that have gone to a digital system for this, which seems to work really well, um, where other rather than having the student take a paper plan to the individual professors, there is a system where it's automatically uploaded and distributed across campus to the required professors, and then they can be certain that the, the professor has the required information. But that's not happening, nor is it required to happen under the law. So once the student takes that plan, which in some instances is still on paper um, and can be on paper, unlike at the high school level, there is also no legal requirement that the plan look a specific way. So some schools use a letter, some schools you know, make a list, it just it depends. The student takes that to the professor. It's now on the professor to ensure that those accommodations are implemented. Under the law, though, this is where the reasonable accommodation language that many of us are probably familiar with comes up again, and that individual professor then is asked to determine if the accommodations that Disability Services has identified as appropriate can actually be reasonably applied to their course. And if they say no, the student is again required themselves to be the person that returns to disability services and asks for an alternative um, or attempts to engage with the professor to uh, come up with a reasonable alternative there. And again, that's, that is the only process that's required right now under the two relevant federal statutes. Very different from what parents are used to in high school where every year there is a required meeting um, where the entirety of the student's academic team gets together, brainstorms ways to better support the student, and then there is a point person from the school that's required to go to each individual teacher and explain what the plan is and how it has to be implemented. And there can't be any pushback from individual teachers at the high school level. So many parents just don't know, um, nor do they understand what to do when their student comes to them and is confronted with this, you know, this very different process. Um, but I think the thing that is probably the most um, glaring difference uh, that, that I often hear from parents, and this is probably universally true for any parent of a college student, is that students are now the keepers of all the information. Parents can still advocate legally on behalf of their child. That's a protected activity under the law. But they're not the individual with any of the rights to enforce any of these accommodations. It's now the student. So the parent is not going to be updated if the student is struggling academically, just like a traditional college student. The, the parent is not going to receive any information. It's all going to go through the student. Um, and again, that's legally uh, the way that it has to happen um, as things are set up now. So, you know. In, in closing, certainly there are, <laughs> there are several key differences between the um, K through 12 system and the college system that 
Um, I would not suggest that anyone has to change or that I'm, I'm not sitting here today to <laughs> suggesting that that's the answer, that these changes should be identical K through 12 and in the college setting. But I think using that as an example of what um, students are comfortable with and what their parents are comfortable with um, and, and basically looking at this uh, as, as an opportunity to bridge the gap, or in other words, use transition opportunities that are provided to students in high school um, as a, a means to train them on how to access the college accommodations um, would be a valuable thing to discuss. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Joe for a question. Thank you, uh, Rep. Miller. Um, and I just want to say thank you uh, for sharing your story, uh, Dr. Gans, I, um, and for everyone that needs to be able to be heard and to be seen for your your own experiences and, and for your own lived experiences, but not just because that makes you braver or or you know more worthy. It's it's simply you are doing what ought to be a normal activity, and you're not being allowed to. And I, for one. Um, hold out the hope that we will hit the day when these types of interactions are seen as a normal course of people's lives where the diversity, the differences uh, are able to be appreciated and recognized and then everyone receives the benefit of, of that recognition and of, of that growth. Um, one of the things that, that struck me from, from what both of you told me is this sense in the academic world of the professor being the ultimate um, you know, a arbiter of what is reasonable or not. And I had family members with these types of experiences and it strikes me that um, we almost need an education system for the professors in this space and, and, and that it does need to reach all the way back into a K through 12 so that there is a more consistent approach to how we uh, teach our children and then the, the you know, professionals and professors that they will become uh, how to treat people and how to, again, recognize the inherent value of, of people. But if either of you could speak a little bit more to that, that concept of, of the professor as the ultimate arbiter and how that can be managed and how those, those, these moments can actually turn into teachable moments um, and not just for an individual student or a full class, but actually for a professor or even a full department. Um, um, thank you so much, and thank you for uh, recognizing the the issue. And I hope you're you're right, and that we will this will be the first step in in moving towards a place where all students can be benefiting from the experience, the the normal experience that they're meant to be. Um, as a, as a professor myself, um, you know I know that there's uh, a lot of professors who protect their academic freedom, and uh, I will leave it to you to discuss the the legal aspect of it. But uh, a lot of universities are not. Um, able to really force professors to take any kind of training. So unlike in the K through 12 where I'm at uh, on the board, uh, we, where we can basically mandate training for our teachers, the universities do not do that and so it's up to the professors themselves to decide whether they want to pursue any kind of training in neurodiversity or treating students. But uh, what I will say is that from my perspective in, in the academia, there have been cases where universities did uh, spend time and money and resources to create centers that would focus on other types of diversity. For example, the LGBTQ um, 
plus community where there are a lot, most universities now have an office that specializes in that where students can go and get support, the professors can go and get support, and, there's, uh, and they kind of serve as advocates and help these students. So there are models where universities decide that one area of diversity is important to do, and so it's, we don't have to really reinvent the, reinvent the wheel, it's there, it's just recognizing that neurodiversity is another type of diversity and in fact very common in colleges and affects a very large population of kids that's just going to continue to grow. Um, so I, I hope that answers. And Thank you, thank you. Our final question to uh, Abigail. Um, I have slightly more of a comment than a question. So, um, I, so I, I also am a neurodiverse person. I was diagnosed back then when it was still called Asperger's. It's not anymore. But um, my, I always joke that I went to a college where everybody was kind of neurodiverse, and so I didn't notice that there was anything different about me until I went to law school. Um, but I, I wonder how, how much effort has been put into the issue of adjunct professors because I was an adjunct professor and I can tell you with no education whatsoever, I was not a professional educator, you know, I was just asked to pinch hit and teach this law class one time and I show up and I found a second year student who had a learning disability, I literally couldn't read, you know, she, she could read you the words but no comprehension of what had been read. Um, no one had caught that somehow, K through 12 or the first year of university and I, a completely non-educated in the field person, was able to figure that out. Um, someone who was trying to hide the fact that they had an autism diagnosis and weren't unfortunately hiding it very well in my class and were having struggles. Um, but what I discovered is that there's basically no support. If you are an adjunct, you're expected, I had to have students come in and make up tests in my conference room of my law office because there was nowhere for even them to do that. Um, there was no training on how to interact with people. And so I got some of these plans, like you're talking about. I had people come in with ADHD, variety of different um, situations, and I would get a letter uh, that was sent to me electronically and nothing else. No instructions on how to accommodate that student, no nowhere to turn, no phone number to call if I didn't know what to do. I was just told, here you go, figure it out. So to me, I think that if you're looking at a, a university accommodation situation, there's so many classes taught by adjuncts that unless you provide some sort of assistance for those folks to be able to help out, um, and they may well have the best of intentions, I know I did, I don't know how well I did because I had absolutely no support whatsoever. So I just wanted to sort of provide an unsolicited piece of advice <laughs> that that might be somewhere to, to turn as well. Thank you, Abigail, and I want to thank our speakers here with it um, very much. I apologize because we are crashing towards yeah. the end, yes. uh, and yeah. I have 24 minutes, yeah. and I need to hear from our last two uh, speakers, so thank you. Uh, Heather Conroy is the co-founder and executive director of Evolve Coaching. She's a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, since 2006, has worked with children, adolescents, and young adults seeking supports and communication uh, um, with communication organization. Her primary focus has been supporting students as they navigate the demands of college environments. Thank you, Heather. Jim, is it Lily? I apologize. Lily, yeah. Lily. Uh, has served as the acting assistant director, sorry, uh, so, I'm sorry, assistant district administrator with the Pittsburgh District Office of OVR's Bureau of Vocational Rehab uh, since 2022. Um, Jim has worked in a variety of positions with OVR and his current responsibilities include serving as a member of the College Policy Work Group. Thank you both, and I'm so sorry about the time, uh, but who would I go to first? I am. Jim? Yep. Let's roll. So, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, as, as Marcy said earlier, on behalf of OVR, we appreciate the opportunity to share who we are, what we're doing, uh, to hopefully have a positive impact on the lives of individuals with disabilities. Specifically to today, I just want to share some highlights of what we do as an agency related to that post-secondary experience. Uh, that individuals could have. So really, dependent upon when an individual is 
introduced to OVR or we learn who they are, you know, as the saying goes, we don't know who we don't know. So we start typically at age 14 working with high schools uh, to do those pre-employment transition services and then to, to help that student as they're transitioning into whatever comes after high school. Sometimes, as Marcy said earlier, there's rapid employment that we're, uh, placement that we're looking at, so those students who want to go straight into employment, uh, but often it's post-secondary. Um, an example I like to use when we um, when I, when I give talks about it is, you don't just walk into a hospital and say, I want to be a nurse. So in order to have that employment, you have to have a certain amount of training that goes along with that. And depending upon what you want to do in the nursing field, you might just need to be in a certificate program and be a medical assistant, or there's the associate degree, and that's a level of nursing you can do when you get to a bachelor level. Uh, that opens up other opportunities in nursing. If you get to master's or uh, doctorate, then you can teach about nursing and other things. So there's a lot of, uh, of avenues with that. So with OVR, we do count. One of the things that we start with in high school, hopefully, is doing counseling on post-secondary opportunities. As was mentioned by one of the speakers earlier, um, knowing what part, part of that counseling is knowing about the colleges and which colleges might be more um, approachable when it comes to the types of accommodations an individual would need or whatever. So as part of what we're talking with students about is helping them to appropriately select uh, which, which co college level of college or, or specific colleges or universities would, would help them uh, in being successful in their academic career. So when we talk about post-secondary and OVR, we're looking at specialty programs, we look at business trade technical schools, uh, community college universities, and then again, training for that career advancement. So if, um, you know, if they have the associate degree but they want to do something else with their career to move to a higher level, then bachelor, master's, uh, whatever the terminal uh, degree would be for the field that they would like to be in. So that's one of the ways that we, we assist people. Also, uh, hopefully beginning in their senior year of high school, uh, if not, you know, when we, when we encounter people at the, at the collegiate level, determining are there assistive technology needs that could help them to be more successful with, with their academic career. Doing evaluations, helping uh, get the equipment, whether that's computer hardware or software or other things that could be uh, of benefit to them in that realm. Uh, and we want to do that before they get to post-secondary so that those um, they're, they're not basically wasting that time in the post-secondary environment and then having to figure out what type of accommodation might uh, ha have been a benefit to them. Um, are there uh, documentation needs related to the world of, of accommodation? Maybe there's some um, disability issues that have never really been diagnosed for that person. So psychological evaluations, medical evaluations, other things that we can determine what is the actual functioning level of that person, whether it's a physical or cognitive or, or what that may be, uh, that can help them. And, you know, typically a, a university is going to want a psychological evaluation, for, uh, for example, and if it recommends uh, accommodation somewhere, you know, ac extra time on testing, whatever those things may be, most universities want that within the last three years. Well, a lot of students may have received it early in their high school career. Unfortunately, with some, some of our public schools, they may not have had an uh, evaluation since seventh or eighth grade. Obviously, a lot can happen between the five or so years before they graduate. Uh, so getting those updated evaluations for individuals so that um, there is the documentation that a university might need. Uh, connect, helping to connect those students with the disability services uh, offices has been talked a little about a little bit about. Each of our uh, high schools around the Commonwealth, uh, each of the universities, has one of our counselors as a liaison. So there is somebody with OVR associated with that disabilities office so that, uh, you know, we can help the students a as necessary with that. Um, you know, a student from Pittsburgh might want to go over to Temple University in Philly, so the, the liaison counselor with Temple can be a go-between with a primary counselor back here in the Pittsburgh area and the student that's, that's there at Temple. So that's been a big benefit for students. Uh, in, in the packet of information that you were given, um, there's a, a program highlight from OVR. One of, and that's from the program year 21, so uh, July 1st, 2021 through June 30 of 2022. During that time, OVR was able to support um, roughly $18,363,000 in financial assistance uh, for post-secondary 
uh, with students. That averages out to about 9,800 per student. Now, this, this varies based upon the needs of the student, what other um, grants or scholarships they might get, whatever their financial need is. We, all, we do have a ceiling of how much we're able to help with each academic year, uh, but that goes a long way to the success of a person post-secondary. Uh, because if we wanted to compare them to a student without a disability, I mean, that student maybe without the disability may be able to carry the full academic load plus carry a part-time job or whatever to help get them you know income that they need and stuff but the student with the, the disability might struggle more with that so us offering financial assistance frees up that they may not have to do the part-time job while they're trying to pay their college bills and stuff um, Again, it's based upon the need of that person, the cost of the school, the financial aid, or things that they may already have. And that $18 million does not include, that, that's tuition assistance type things that we do. It doesn't include the assistive technology and all those other things that we may have uh, been able to have that individual benefit from. Um, and then we, we have a program called College Resources for Success, which, you know, Heather, uh, as Evolve Coaching, that's one of the big things they do for us. We, we help uh, financially support so that, um, programs like, like what Heather has with Evolve can work with those students to um, you know, help them have the supports and success that they need with that. And then until their 22nd birthday, they're still eligible to do that pre-employment uh, things that we do, the paid work experiences, the job shadows, those things that are experienced and, and um, pre-vocational, I guess, to try to help that person make sure they're going in the right direction. Try out jobs related to the field that you're studying in to see if that would be a benefit. And, and new with our college resource uh, for success is also adding an employment aspect to those college students where whether it's summer or throughout the semester where we can offer that support um, you know, at those sites uh, so that they can become successful. Because a lot of times it's those soft skills that, you know, and, and, and talking about, you know, the students with dis different disabilities and how they relate and, um, and, and after talking about her, her daughter and the, those things, that support is so crucial uh, to people being successful. Uh, so those are some things, some, uh, some great things I think that OVR does uh, on behalf of, of students in the post-secondary world so that, you know, again, our ultimate goal, as Marcy mentioned with our mission, is employment, but that post-secondary experience is vital to some of those areas of employment, so we want to be successful there so that they can then in turn be successful in employment. Thanks, Jim, and I know you went quick for that, so I appreciate it. No problem. So let's get to Heather and see if we could do a couple things at the end. Heather? Good job, Jim. Hi, I'm Heather Conroy. Hi, thanks for, for having us and for bringing everybody together today, Rhett Miller. Um, so I'm the director of Evolve Coaching, and we're a nonprofit that supports adults primarily, and primarily autistic adults who are looking for support with college, employment, and who are artists, maybe creating an entrepreneurial path for themselves. I do say autistic because, rather than person with autism, simply because the client base that we support tends to prefer identity first language, so I just want to say that while I continue to go on and potentially confuse folks. Um, Right, so since 2014, our nonprofit team has grown by leaps and bounds, not because I intended it to, but because there's an intense need um, nationally, but also definitely here in the state of Pennsylvania and in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, last year, we supported 265 individuals. Um, again, not our intention, happy to do it though. <laughs> um, and we also supported their employers and 60 colleges um, here in the state and outside of the state. And so we're, you know, this all doesn't happen in a vacuum. We don't support individuals only. We have to think about the systems that need supporting as well. So we've talked about a lot of that today. And that's something that while I'm a clinical social worker, I learned to work with individuals. Um, it has become my, my job to learn how to teach professors and learn how to teach employers to build welcoming spaces for all people, including our clients. Um, I'd like to offer some information today about students in high school, students in college, and a toolkit we're creating to help professionals in both high school and college education environments better support their autistic students. So Daphna mentioned some likely very surprising statistics that I'd like to bring us back to just for a second. Um, far fewer disabled students enroll in college and a third of autistic students enroll, um, and roughly 40% of those students will complete their degrees. Not to toot a horn, but I'll tell you that with the right supports, the students that we support, 92% of them complete their degrees. That's higher than nationally the numbers. Um, we need to understand the types of supports that people need human beings on an individual basis, um, and there is no sort of 
blanket change we can make, but I will suggest one in a bit. Um, there's some systemic issues nationally here in PA um, and as well across the nation. Um, we need to prepare students, so I'll talk about high school. We need to prepare students to understand what they're embarking on after high school and how to navigate the complex and new systems ahead of them. Kristen did a great job of discussing that earlier. Um, one, is the student motivated to be in school and do they recognize the value of support that they will need in school, potentially? And related to that, does the student connect their learning to their future career? Do they understand that big picture and why they're going to school, not because mom and dad told them to, not because teachers told them that that's the next step, but do they really have an understanding of why they are there and how that connects to having a family, having a home, having a job? Um, has the student had work experience or did they get to take one college level course before leaving the high school system? Uh, three, has the student been made aware of the option to request postponing high school graduation if they're wholly unprepared for the next phase of life? Four, has the student had opportunity to self-advocate and be in the driver's seat? It's my opinion that this is what students are least prepared to do, self-advocating. And again, people represented that well today. So shifting to the college space, um, when it comes to colleges, Students need consistency from dedicated and well-trained professionals, and they, those professionals need to receive ongoing supervision. Um, these professionals should have disability and mental health experience. Some of you may know or may not know that, at least my, my field, autistic people, 70% of those individuals will also have a co-occurring mental health diagnosis. So we really need to be prepared to support people on various levels. And I'll just say, didn't plan to talk about this, but many people that we support um, are sort of jaded by the systems that they've been invited to participate in. So therapy has not supported them in the way that maybe it supports other people. And so it's important for us to create space so that people can, can self-advocate and they aren't sort of slapped in the face with like, oh, well, you're asking for something that's out of the ordinary or why can't you do this just because you seem intelligent. I can't assume that you're going to just be fine. Um, Okay, sorry, getting back to it. <laughs> uh, professionals need to recognize students are coming from all walks of life, and they have a wide range of life experiences. We need to presume competence of the individuals that we're supporting, but we can't presume that people have had all of the experiences that perhaps their peers have had. And we can't assume that they can you know, learn these things through osmosis. <laughs> we, need to, we need to understand that people need explicit instruction. Professors and even disability service providers at universities need to recognize that accommodations are in place to establish an equal playing field, not a handout that will fail to prevent them from succeeding in the real world. Um, the biggest thing professionals should understand is that it's our job to empathize with students and work to teach them, rather than wait for them to learn the thing on their own or, again, through osmosis or observation. Um, there's simply no one-size-fits-all approach to supporting a group of people who are vastly different from one another. Um, just like any other subgroup, we don't expect all women to have the same needs and we don't expect all people with disabilities to have the same needs. Um, and something that we're doing to take a stab is we've created a toolkit. Well, it will be ready at the end of this month. We were hopeful that it would be ready for you today. I do have a fancy QR code if you would like to at, join the sign up list to get this, this toolkit. Something for free with support from the Richard King Mellon Foundation. Um, we pulled and prioritized autistic voices and other neurodivergent voices um, as we've created this toolkit. We've also pulled profess professors, parents, um, to understand what are the needs of students as they transition to college. Um, we can't cover everything, everyone is an individual, but our toolkit focuses on lots of tips, but the biggest one is empathy. The biggest one is understanding you have an experience, I need to meet you on your level, and if I do that, it may take some amount of work in the, in the beginning, but following that, we're gonna have an easier time together. Um, so the, the toolkit addresses challenges that exist um, in our systems um, and doesn't focus on the challenges that maybe autistic people have or experience, but rather what in our society is preventing them from succeeding um, to, their, to their capacity. Um, and so with that, I would love, thank you Nick for um, back on the ground here. <laughs> um, I'd love to 
just share with you, it's a minute and a half, don't worry, <laughs> a video from some of the people who participated in the toolkit, sharing their perspectives, um, the biggest takeaways for them that they would like educating, education professionals and other individuals to understand about them. People might be trying really, really hard to keep it together, and if there aren't external signals that that failure is happening, it can be really jarring. Um, and that hard work is is you know is for value. I think they could like give them more better materials, help them prepare better for tests. I wish they could be more random measures to understand what I'm going through being a man on the spectrum. Expand your horizon a little bit more. See, I kept my promise. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate that. Okay. You know, look, I, I let me say a couple things, and maybe it'll be a bit of a closing, but also... Um, just in case anybody else has a question or something. Look, the um, over the last, uh, uh, I was a, a teach. I, I got my teaching certificate in 1997, uh, and at that time, the special education world that I was exposed to and I had to go through in order to become a teacher um, uh, was vastly different to where we are now. And there's so much that's good uh, in that. Um, there's so much positivity that comes from what we call inclusion on the special education side now versus where it was in my experience or where it was when I was becoming a teacher. Um, and as we see those successes, when we are, for example, graduating more kids from their neighborhood schools and um, educating more kids with their neighborhood peers, there's, there's pluses with that. There's no doubt. Uh, by the same token, uh, I am coming across stories about where that success is not translating into uh, post-secondary. Um, and uh, we heard a couple great things here that I think I was getting some text, stirred a lot of thoughts. Um, and I'll be honest, one of the things that I think we come back to, Jim, is in relation to um, what is going on in the transition stage. Uh, because a good transition coordinator seems to be a game changer. Uh, a bad transition coordinator, uh, coordinator sinks your kid. Um, and um, you know, I think that's something that we need to need to talk about. Uh, that sort of, uh, for we use this warm handoff language uh, in other ways, but to make that handoff appropriately, um, you know, uh, I can't tell if, if the schools are not, um, some schools are not adapt, uh, adept in, in, in doing that and to the level that they should be. Um, there were so many things uh, that came up. We were talking about, um, ways that the evalu evaluation uh, can be done. I I'm a little lost as to what that final report is. When you're, if you're starting at 14, what is that, what's at the end? Why does any kid, if schools, for example, want three years uh, back and that's it, why does any kid leave there without that done? Why does any kid leave high school without that transition meeting that says, well, dude, you're gonna need this? Like, wh why is that happening? Most likely because probably there's economics involved. Schools don't want to pay for it, something else that's going on. But I mean, like, why would you set that kid back without having them leave with the paperwork they need to, to be successful? Uh, I took a whole list of notes that came on. And look, here's the end, uh, the end of the, uh, the point of this here for it, um, is um, we need to build off of these systems, right? And, and there's so much for everybody to be proud of as far as where we're, uh, wh what we've done. Um, but um, uh, Abigail is very open with her diagnosis, which, which, which I appreciate. Uh, but we need more Abigails and more Jess Benham, who is always open with her diagnosis. Uh, they need to not be the exceptions. Uh, and, and, you know, they are now maybe a little bit, right? Right? Maybe a little bit. But we need them to not be. They don't want to be. I know this, right? And this is what we need them not to be. Uh, and so creating that stronger pathway forward. Well, if, if you're trying to graduate a kid and send a kid to college, your kid grades in and that's fantastic. Is that college necessary having the supports that is going to make it more likely that kid 
with any sort of exceptionalities may find that success. It doesn't matter to a parent of a, of a loved one um, if, if you are taking your uh, neurotypical kids and you're graduating them at 89%, that's fantastic. What are you doing for the kids who are not your neurotypical kids? And what can we replicate? And here's the exciting thing for us as legislators. Get this. We happen to own a state university system, right? And then we happen to fund a bunch of other schools as well. And that gives us an opportunity to think about that. My friends, I want to thank our, our, our speakers here, and I want to thank everybody for it. Um, look, uh, who was here the whole time? Joe was here the whole time. Joe, all right, look, I want to thank everybody uh, who made it. I'll tell you, Joe, that, that was long. Was it good? From, from Philly all the way out here. Look, uh, and I know a bunch of you stayed the whole way as well. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Look, the Disability Mental Health Summit only works because we have so many people who give their time. The speakers aren't paid to show up. You know, Joe comes from out uh, east. These guys are running around to get out here. Look, there's so much. Uh, you know, is he making the trip? Um, and, and you guys making it work. Um, uh, it is my favorite event that we do. Uh, this, uh, this one here, it made me feel that, you know what, maybe next year we, maybe we do a little bit more. Uh, so we're not done, but I want to thank everybody for it. I want to thank Unique Source, uh, PA, and St. Clair for their support. I want to thank the great people of Bethel who make everything possible. All right, thank all of you. Uh, please do stay in touch. We'll hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much for your time.